In our last lesson, we looked at what vapor pressure was, and we learned that vapor pressure is affected by temperature, it's affected by the strength of the intermolecular forces, and it's the point where the evaporation and the condensation are happening at the same rate. We're going to focus in on the temperature aspect and get into the world of the calculations and being able to see what would the vapor pressure be if we knew the temperature and vice versa. We'll also be able to, by the end of this lesson, look about how uh, external pressure will affect boiling point because we know that boiling point and vapor pressure are tied together. The definition of boiling point has to do with the vapor pressure and the external pressure. So let us um, start with this graph. We've seen this graph before. We've seen that uh, as the temperature goes up, which you see that along the x-axis, that the vapor pressure is increasing. So I want you to look at that relationship and just answer the question. Is that a linear relationship? We love linear relationships. Is that relationship between vapor pressure and temperature linear? Well, no, it's not a linear relationship. This is an exponential relationship. So while one increases, the other one is increasing. That is true. It's not in a straight line, and that's what it means to be a linear relationship. Um, and that would be a direct proportionality. One increases, the other one increases in a linear fashion. But we can turn this relationship into a li linear relationship with the natural log. If this is exponential, the inverse of that exponential function is a natural log function. So the way we turn this into a straight line is by taking the, using the natural log of those things. So now this is called the clausius clapeyron equation. And this clausius clapeyron equation is an equation that shows us that we can plot temperature and, and the natural log. Now, not just temperature, it's one over temperature. Okay, that's what is the x correspondence, and the y correspondence is the natural log of vapor pressure, which we're seeing plotted there. So we have this in what is called the slope-intercept form of a line, y equals mx plus b. So we've, re we've related the y to the natural log of the vapor pressure, we've related x to 1 over t, and now we can relate and see what the slope would be. The m is the slope, okay, and all of this would be the slope. And the y-intercept is the natural log of a, a value there that we will not discuss. So what, does that, what do we see with this equation? We see that a plot of natural log of vapor pressure for a substance versus one over its temperature will give us a straight line with a slope equal to this value. Now, why would we use this? How would we utilize this information? Well, we would measure temperature and vapor pressure and plot out points, and so we see these points being plotted out. We would graph those and come up with a best straight line fit of those points. And we could take this slope, and that's what's being given right here. We could take that slope of a negative, in this case, 3773, and we could set it equal to the slope value, minus delta HVAP over R. And we could figure out and calculate the heat of vaporization. Okay, that delta H of vaporization. So that is how we would utilize that equation. But how many points does it take to define a straight line? Truly, only two points are needed. So this is the clausius clapeyron equation with two points. Now, how did this equation get derived? I want to back up to the previous slide, and let's look at it. If we take this equation, and we do it for one point, and let's call it uh, that's the wrong side of my pen. Let's call it P1 and T1. So we have this temperature and that vapor pressure, I mean, in that yeah, vapor pressure. And then we do it at another point, so we have a T2 and a P2, and we take those two mathematical expressions and subtract them from each other, okay, we will end up with this equation. So this is a clausius clapeyron equation for two points you need to know both equations. Now, if you know the one equation and you think about how it's derived, it's easy to remember this second equation. You simply have the two points, and you're subtracting the two minus the one. I would like to do it that way because it's final minus initial kind of idea, um, but the two minus the one. And if you do, and let me um, write on the screen here, you know, if you're subtracting these two equations and you're gonna have the natural log, of P2 
on, on the left hand side minus the natural log of P1 and just as a reminder when you do that that would be the same thing as this. So this is something you would have learned along the way that P2 um, over P1 the natural log of that is the same as this piece here. So that's where that equation comes from. So with this equation what we can do is well first of all we need to realize what R we need to use. R is ideal gas constant and R is always a constant but we have different units for it and so different numerical values for it depending upon which R we need to use. Now the reason we want to use this one is it has the energy unit of joule in there and vapor pressure will be in the energy unit of joule as well. Although very often it's not reported in joules, very often when you go to tables and you look up values of delta H of vaporization, they're going to be in units of kilojoules per mole. So we have to make sure we're very careful to watch our units. And we can also, because of our R value, and we see the unit for R, joules per mole Kelvin, what unit is your temperature going to need to be in? Well, it's going to need to be, when you plug it into this equation, it will not work unless you plug it into this equation in units of Kelvin. So it's very common for a mistake to happen because students forget or don't watch their units, just plug and chug. Um, tried very hard this semester and last semester to train you into using your units. Always write your units down. You will make so many fewer mistakes if you write your units down. When a student sees an equation like this and they've got it memorized and they see all their variables given and they're wanting to solve for one, they just put numbers in and don't watch those units and make sure that they are canceling the way they should cancel. So we're going to work through this example here. Put my pen down over on this side and uh, work it on the light board. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to write our equation. We're looking at here, it's not the first thing we're going to do, because the first thing we really need to do is look at this equation and say, why in the world would I use that cautious clapper equation? They're telling me what the, they're asking me what the boiling point on Matt Everest is, knowing that the atmospheric pressure is 32 atmospheres. So they want me to determine the boiling point. And in the cloches clapper equation, there is no boiling point written. There's vapor pressure. But let us think about the definition of boiling point. All right? So the boiling point is when the vapor pressure equals the external, external pressure too many equal signs in there. This is the definition of boiling point. It's the point, it's the temperature when the vapor pressure equals the external pressure. So the clausius clapper equation, which I'll go ahead and write here, P2 over P1, we put vapor pressures in there. But the vapor pressures and boiling points are the point where the vapor pressure equals the external uh, vapor pressure or the external pressure, and we see an atmospheric pressure of 0.32, so that is a vapor pressure. If it's boiling there, the vapor pressure is matching that external pressure. And we'll continue writing the equation, minus delta H VAP, did they give me that in the problem? Yes, they did, over R, and 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. So before we go and start plugging things in, let's define are variables. As I read through there, I know about water this fact. I know that when the pressure of the outside world, when the vapor pressure pushing, I mean the atmospheric pressure pushing down on a system is one atmosphere, that water boils at a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius, which if you add 273 to that is 373 Kelvin. This is the atmospheric pressure. It's boiling, so this is also the vapor pressure. And that's what we plug into this equation. Let me say that again. This is the atmospheric pressure when water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. This is the atmospheric pressure. The definition of boiling point is when the vapor pressure matches that. So this is the vapor pressure that we can plug into there. Now P2, we want to know when P2, when the atmospheric pressure pushing down is 0.32 atmospheres, okay, when the atmospheric pressure is pushing down with 0.32 and that matches the vapor pressure of 0.32, we know it will boil and we want to know at what temperature is that going to happen. 
what temperature will boil at. So it's not a straightforward vapor pressure problem because they never mention vapor pressure, but because the tie-in between boiling point and vapor pressure are there, we can use those external pressures as our vapor pressures. So now we can start plugging in. We have the natural log of P2 that I called 0.32 atmospheres. We have the vapor pressure P1 of, uh, not zero, let's get rid of that, <laughs> one atmosphere. Okay? Now, would it matter what pressure units I put in there? They cancel each other out. So I could use TOR, I could use millimeters of mercury, I could use PSI, I could use whatever unit I want in there because those units are going to cancel out. This is going to be equal to a minus, and the delta H VAP is given to me, and it's 4.7 kilojoules per mole, and I have an R of 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Do you see any issues with what I've written so far? Anything that I need to do before I can actually divide those together? Look at my unit. I have a kilojoule here and I have a joule here. I either have to choose to convert this to joules or I have to choose to convert this to kilojoules. It doesn't matter which way you go. I will choose to convert my kilojoules to joules. One kilojoule is 10 to the third joules. So now I've got this portion of my equation laid out here. And now I've got my last bit, 1 over T2. I've established that that's the T I'm trying to find, okay? Minus 1 over T1, and I've established that this is 373 Kelvin, knowing I need to put it into Kelvin. All right, so now I've just got to start doing the algebra. When I take the natural log of 0.32, I get the value of a negative 1.1394. And it has no units. When I do the multiplication and the division that I see there, and make sure I don't drop that negative sign, I have 4,895. What unit will I have? Well, the kilojoules are canceling, the joules are canceling, the moles are canceling, and I have Kelvin in the denominator of the denominator. Taking something divided by a fraction is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal, and that gets K up in the numerator. And then I have 1 over T2 minus 1 over 373 Kelvin. Now I'm going to divide this over here, okay? So when I divide this into that value, I get the number, the minuses are going to cancel. It's a very small number because I'm taking a fairly small number and dividing it by a large number. I've got three zeros. I could have put it in scientific notation, and I probably should, but it's a very small number, 23276. 23276. And what are the units? Well, I've brought K underneath, so this is 1 over K. This is equal to 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1, which is 0 point, not so many zeros, 0, 0, 0026809. Okay? And that is 1 over K. Okay? That's that part. Now I'm going to add this to this side. Because it's subtracted here, I'm going to add it to that side. They have the same units, so I can add apples to apples there, so that works very nicely. And when I add this to this side, I get the value of 0 0.002913, 1 over K, and that is equal to 1 over T2. Now, how do I get T2? I take the reciprocal. So T2 is actually 1 over this value, 0.002913K. And when I take 1 over that number, sorry, 1 over K, 1 over this number, I will get my T2. And it will be in Kelvin. It is 343 Kelvin. Now, sometimes they'll give it to you in, uh, oh, you know, they'll want the answer in Celsius rather than Kelvin. We know that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius at uh, one atmosphere. If we take and subtract 273 from this value, we're going to get 70 degrees Celsius. 
Okay, so either this in Kelvin or this in Celsius. Now let's think about our answer. Does it make sense? Always stop and think about that. Okay, work through this problem. There's a lot of places I could have gone wrong, a lot of places I could have put it incorrectly into my calculator. Does this number make sense? This is what we know about boiling point. It is going to decrease as the atmospheric pressure decreases. So the atmospheric pressure dropped to 0.32, so the temperature should go down, and water will boil at a much lower temperature. If you try to cook something at the top of Mount Everest, though I doubt anybody ever takes time to try to do that, it would take a lot longer to cook because you're cooking it at a much lower temperature. So your egg that you tried to boil would really have to cook a long time before you could um, get it uh, to your liking. Okay, so what are we seeing here? We have an equation called the cloches clapeyron equation. We don't give you equations. You have to memorize this equation. It is an equation that gives you a linear relationship between pressure and temperature. We have this two-point equation that we can use if we only know two data points or we know one or trying to get the other. But if you have come across a problem where they give you multiple data points, you shouldn't just pick two. That's not your best choice. If you have multiple data points, you ought to put them into an Excel spreadsheet. You ought to graph them out. You ought to determine the slope of that line and then you could get information about that linear relationship by reading it off the graph. Um, but if it's only a two point problem, this is what you do. Now for an exam, I'm never going to make you graph something. So you can know that. You might have homework problems, you might have lab problems in which you've got to do the graphing. But as far as an exam question, I won't make you have to, because I don't want you to use a graphing calculator, number one, I'm not going to make you take time to plot them out on a piece of graphing paper and try to find the best straight line. That's just a too time consuming. But in terms of graphing, I might give you information from a graph. I might, and let's go back to that graph real quick, I might give you the slope of the, the, the equation and say, okay, I've given you the slope. This is what was plotted. I'm giving you the slope. You tell me the vapor pressure. So I might do that, or not the vapor pressure, the heat of vaporization. I might give you the slope and ask you to calculate delta H VAP, but I'm not going to make you plot it. Okay, so that, that concludes our calculations between temperature and vapor pressure.